Hey everyone, this is Nick and on this weekly Linux news video we have a lot less gaming news than usual as the Steam Deck hype starts slowly ramping down. But that's okay because we have a ton of Linux desktop related stuff to cover. This week we have a nice outline for the future plans of GNOME, including a recoloring API for LibAdvita and also accent colors by default. We also have Ubuntu 22.04 seeing its first beta and it's gearing up to be a major, major release, apart from the fact that it's already going to be an LTS. And we also have an awesome tool that lets you remove Snap from your Ubuntu installation and replace every Snap with a Flatpak. So let's get started right after I tell you how today's sponsor is going to let you get a $100 free credit for your Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. You can block mine, but it's gonna make me even poorer. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credit and get started. Okay, so Chris Davis, a GNOME developer, outlined plans for the next releases of GNOME, including GNOME 43 and after. The major things they want to work on is Accent Colors and the recoloring API for LibAdvita. Accent Colors are self-explanatory, they already exist in KDE, Elementor iOS or Ubuntu, and they let you pick a dominant color that will permeate through the desktop and icons. And GNOME wants to make these desktop agnostic, so KD apps would also use the color set for GNOME and vice versa. The recoloring API is meant for developers mainly to let them change the main colors of LibAdvita into something else and give more personality to their apps. They also want to work on a new file chooser that would be handled by Nautilus and not by GDK anymore and on making Nautilus responsive so it can work well on mobile devices. Finally, there's also a new image viewer that's more modern, that is touchscreen and touchpad friendly, and will get editing capabilities in the future. There are a few other interesting ideas and proposals, but for now they're just that, proposals. Even though they do look like they're going to make GNOME a more interesting platform for developers and for users as well. Various GNOME developers and app developers also made progress last week on a bunch of apps and components. The GNOME Logs app was ported to LibAdvita and GTK4, and WebKit GTK, the built-in rendering engine used by GNOME Web, for example, now uses widgets that resemble the ones used in LibAdvita, and it also supports CSS accent colors. Shortwave, a web radio player, can now add local stations that aren't available in the list that Shortwave uses, and work continues on Pika Backup, a nice file backup app with a lot of improvements. Identity, the app that lets you compare two files side by side, now supports pinch to zoom with the touchpad. And there's an interesting app called Just Perfection that lets you customize the GNOME shell and disable UI elements. Exciting stuff happening here. I really feel like the release of LibAdvita and GNOME 42 and GDK4 has really kicked things up a notch in terms of app development. And of course, if you want to find some interesting GNOME apps, I made a video about that a few days ago. You can check it up in the card up top. Now, KDE developers weren't idle either though, and there's a bunch of interesting new things being worked on. Two 15-minute bugs were fixed and two new were added to the list, so no change to the total there, and KWrite will now use the same code base as Kate, but with a bunch of features turned off for people who prefer a simpler experience. This should make maintaining both apps a lot easier. If you choose the picture of the day wallpaper, you will now be able to preview it and see some metadata, and there's a new and improved tablet mode that will make all Breeze-themed controls bigger and easier to use with a touchscreen. Icons in the task manager will also get a lot more spacing in this tablet mode. There's a new configuration screen to handle Wacom Express Key remote devices in the X11 session, and there are a lot of bugs being fixed and user interface improvements for various apps. I'm really super excited about every new development on these major desktop environments, KDE or GNOME, Things are just progressing so quickly, new stuff is added all the time, it feels like we're in 2006 again, and 
yeah, I'm old, but still, it's nice. Deepin 20.5 was released and it brings a bunch of improvements to the Chinese Linux distribution that's often praised for its looks. Among these changes, there's face recognition to let you unlock your computer and authenticate just by using your face, similar to what Howdy or Slimbook Face already do. Screenshots can also be pinned to the desktop and stay on top of open windows. That's pretty handy if you often need to use these in bug reports, for example. The mail app has custom folder management, the video player supports more file formats, the global search lets you use file types and extensions for your searches, and the music player now supports drag and drop to reorder songs in playlists. It's been a long while since I tried Deepin, but since it's based on an older Debian release, I'd be more inclined to use just the desktop on a more modern distro. I need to give it a good look. The beta for Ubuntu 22.04 was released and can be downloaded right now. The next LTS version of Ubuntu, codenamed Jammy Jellyfish, is an interesting one, since it renews with the current GNOME release cycle, shipping GNOME 42 and all its improvements, like the new shell look that's also completely light this time around if you pick the light mode. You also get redesigned on-screen display elements, like when changing the volume, and the Yaru theme seems to apply to LibAdvita apps, so it seems like these can be themed still, although they use a lot more orange than they used to. There are also accent colors, the new screenshot experience, a new file manager icon, and folder icons that follow the accent color you picked. All default apps also got a nice version bump, and it uses the kernel version 5.15 with Mesa Drivers version 22. The software center is still way behind the default GNOME experience though. The new installer still isn't ready yet, so it won't be there out of the box. You can expect a video review of Ubuntu 22.04 on the channel and a rundown of the major changes on its most important uh, variants or flavors, as they call them. So subscribe if you're interested in that. Speaking of Ubuntu, there's a new tool in town if you like that distro, but not the snaps it uses. It's called Unsnap, and it lets you remove all snaps from your distro and replace them with flatback integration. It's a very early release, so it might not be perfect just yet, and it works by generating scripts that you can review before applying. Basically, it backups each installed snap, it installs Flatpak and enables Flathub, it installs the Flatpak equivalent of all your snaps if they exist, it removes these snaps, and finally it removes Snapd. For now, it uses a manual list to map snaps to Flatpak apps, so it's not complete yet, and of course anyone can contribute to improve that list. For now, there is no restoring feature. If you want to go back to snaps, you'll have to do it manually. What's interesting is that this tool is being developed by Alan Pope, which up until a year ago was working at Canonical as a snap advocate. Isn't that ironic? Well, it is according to the Alanis Morissette definition of irony. If you've used Fedora or seen one of my videos about it, you know that the installer is its weak point. It uses weird button placements. It's not very legible. Partitioning isn't super clear, and the whole hub design just isn't what users are used to. Well, there are good news, as Anaconda is being redesigned to use the much more familiar Wizard model with step-by-step -step guided instructions. That's what virtually every other Linux installer uses, from Ubuntu to Manjaro to Pop! OS, and what Windows or Mac OS also uses. So while it might not be new or fancy, it's still probably the right choice. Of course, it's all just early stages, and there's just a simple mock-up made using Patternfly, an open-source design system. We'll probably have to wait a bit before it actually ships in a Fedora release, but I for one applaud the decision. Although at that point, if they're going with the wizard approach, I don't really know why they wouldn't just reuse something that already exists, like the elementary OS installer or Calamares, for example. The Linux Foundation is now reopening applications for their training scholarships. The program started in 2011, and 1100 scholarships have already been awarded to train and certify people on various Linux and open source topics. If you're interested, you have until the end of April to apply in one of 12 topics, including the Linux kernel, system administration, blockchain, web development, cybersecurity, or general open source knowledge. Most courses are done through e-learning and remotely, so virtually anyone can benefit. Of course, not everyone can get one, so you'll have to fill in a pretty long application form, ironically made with Google Forms, and wait to see if you win one of these scholarships or not. Can't hurt to try though, it's a free scholarship, and I mean, I think one of my viewers last year told me that they got into one of these, so kudos. Something I missed last week, Mozilla outlined their vision for the evolution of the web. 
They point out that the web is now home to a lot of spyware from corporations and governments and can be hostile, sluggish or increasingly complex, and it lacks accessibility, especially for non-English speakers or for people with disabilities. Their vision boils down to protecting user privacy and protecting them from malicious code, encrypting everything, adding new capabilities safely without just making the web browser into an OS. They also want to make the web fast again and easy for anyone to publish stuff online. They want to let people experience the web as they want it rather than just doing what the website wants. They also want to make the web more accessible to non-English speakers and to people with disabilities, notably through screen readers. Laudable goals, although there aren't any implementation details of what they are planning to do with their own products to support that more user-friendly web. There are more details in the full paper, but it's mostly just theoretical stuff, not really practical features. Speaking of Mozilla, Firefox 99 was released, with support for the GDK overlay scroll bars. These will now work a lot like their GDK counterparts, being hidden when not in use, appearing when scrolling, and increasing in size when you try to click on them to drag the web page around. They're not enabled by default, but you can turn them on easily enough in the About Config page. There's also a new shortcut. Pressing the letter N will toggle Narration, and Firefox now supports the Web MIDI API. They also improved sandboxing, as the processes that are exposed to web content can't access the X server anymore, so things should be more secure. But Nick, Chrome reached version 100 before Firefox. It must mean that Firefox sucks, right? Lutris gets even better with the new 0.5.10 release. The big update for Steam Deck owners is, well, Steam Deck support. Unfortunately, it's still not available as a flat pack, although the developer is working on it. Still, if you manage to bypass the read-only protection of the system, and are okay with reinstalling Lutris after each Steam Deck update, you can get it from the AUR. Adding a new title now brings a new wizard window with a lot of options to streamline adding your games to the library, and there is now support for Origin and Ubisoft Connect, just like Lutris already works with the Epic Game Store. You'll need to install the respective clients in Lutris for that integration to work. You'll also be able to enable Battle Life support, download patches and DLC for GOG games, and F-Sync will be enabled by default. Despite some pretty weird anti-noob positions from the main developer of Lutris, Lutris is a super user-friendly tool to get your gaming on on Linux. Hopefully they can add the Flatpak support really soon so it's a breeze to install on the Steam Deck and everywhere else. It seems like the success of the Steam Deck and its nice shiny new OS is attracting others. One X player, another maker of gaming handheld PCs, traditionally using Windows as the main OS, would be interested in offering devices with SteamOS 3 pre-installed. They've actually started working on that already, which is cool. One X player devices are usually a lot more expensive than the Steam Deck, and they don't tend to perform a lot better, but maybe using SteamOS would give them a nice performance boost, especially with FSR being integrated out of the box. They would at least save up on the cost of the Windows license, and they could still offer Windows for people who really, really want total game compatibility. It's always super cool to see more manufacturers pushing Linux devices, and maybe gaming is the last final push that Linux needs to actually become mainstream on the desktop. Speaking of the Steam Deck, it passed the awesome 2000 certified games mark last week. There are now more than a thousand verified titles and about a thousand more marked as playable. Of course, a lot more are also playable even though they've not been reviewed by Valve, but that number is pretty amazing for marketing purposes. Among the big names now officially compatible, we have Death Stranding, Director's Cut, Frostpunk or Sniper Elite. Can you name any other console that has that many certified titles that can run on it like two months after its release? Some might argue that there are even more games that you can play on these devices than actual devices shipped to people, but yeah. Sorry, Q3 people. Finally, Proton might get support for NVIDIA's image scaling feature. You're probably familiar with the ability to use AMD's equivalent, called FSR, in any game, even those that don't support it officially, thanks to a launch argument in Steam. Well, NVIDIA would like to do the same thing with DLSS, which is pretty cool. It's currently only a pull request on Proton adding that launch variable, and there is no guarantee it will be accepted. But I personally hope it will, as the more options we have for that stuff, the better old titles we'll be able to run on our Linux PCs. 
And who knows, it might even make its way into Gamescope on SteamOS 3, so you could make a home console running SteamOS 3 with an NVIDIA GPU and still benefit from this super nice technology running natively on your graphics card. That would be really nice. Really nice, just like today's sponsor, Slimbook. These guys are based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops and desktops for all price ranges, they ship worldwide, they've got most of the keyboard layouts that you might want. And they make really cool devices, I only use their stuff nowadays, their laptop and their desktop. They also make the Slimbook 1, which is a fantastic small form factor PC with a great aluminium enclosure, good performance with Ryzen CPUs, and they just updated it, so I'm waiting for my review unit to give it a good poke and a good review. But in the meantime, you can already click the link in the description below, check out the specs, check out the look, and just buy one if you're interested. They're really, really awesome devices running Linux out of the box. So thank you everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, and if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. You can also help me make more of these videos by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Both of these get access to the weekly Patreon cast and to the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!